One, two. Good morning, everybody. How are we? We okay? You're here. You're here. Uh, welcome to our Good Friday communion service. We don't get to Sunday without Friday, I'm afraid. And um, it's a poignant day and a reminder before we get to celebrate. It's good to ponder on actually all that Jesus went through for each one of us. So we're going to do that today. Um, But I don't know about anybody else, but I feel like a coiled spring. And I can't wait till Sunday. Uh, But we must sit in Friday for a little bit, okay? So I'm wearing black. This This is me mourning, okay? For Good Friday. So I don't want to see any smiles today. I'm not allowed to smile, okay? You're in church. You've got to be miserable in church. Well done, Glynis. That's your best performance. <laughs> no, on, on it, she, she, she began to... I could see... That's it. That's it. That's it. Hope Community Church. <laughs> Hope Community Church. Um, but yeah, we're going we're gonna to worship. We're going to ponder. We're going to reflect. And we're going to break bread together before uh, we finish today. And... Come back and celebrate and lift the roof on Easter Sunday. So hopefully you're in preparation for that. And um, I want you to sing, but I want you to keep your voice also for Sunday. Okay? But I do want you to sing today. The team are going to lead us in worship in a moment. Um, Psalm 22, just to bring us to uh, a moment. Psalm 22 says, my God, my God, why hast thou for... I'm reading from the New King James Version just for added effect today. I know some of you only believe that this is the one true inherent word of God. But there are other translations available. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so from helping me and from the words of my roaring? My God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season I am not silent. But thou art holy, O thou, and inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered, they trusted in thee and were not confounded. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. All that they see me laugh up to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have besessed me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and feet. I may tell all my bones that they look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. But be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength, haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. I will declare the name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Yet that fear the Lord, praise him, all ye the seed of Jacob. Glorify him and fear him, all ye the seed of Israel. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Neither had he did his face from him, but when he cried unto him, he heard. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. 
All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. And all they that be fat upon earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born that he hath done this. Let's stand. Hundreds and hundreds of years, Psalm 22 was written and it describes exactly what Jesus went through what was on his heart, what he saw, what he witnessed, what he heard, what he felt. And it reminds us that he was human and he felt rejection, he felt pain, he felt abandonment and he willingly accepted it all. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the cross this morning. And that, Lord, without Friday, there is no Sunday. And so we reflect today on the cost, on the sacrifice, on the death that Jesus went through, that Jesus paid, that Jesus surrendered for us. Thank you, Father, that it was in your providence. It was in your plan. This day didn't surprise you, but you knew that this day had to happen so that we would gain inheritance, so that we would be adopted, so that we would call Abba Father. Father, thank you. Holy Spirit, as we ponder today, Would you speak to our hearts? Would you speak to our situation? Would you speak to our humanity? So that we would get a glimpse, a glimpse today of what Jesus went through. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for carrying the cross which you were going to be hung on, for giving your life for us, for paying the price so that we would gain everything. Amen. Let's worship.
Hello. Thank you. <laughs> I'll start for the third time. He received 39 stripes because 40 was known to kill a man. They wanted him alive. They held handfuls of his beard and hair and pulled it out by the roots. They wanted him alive. They kicked, punched, and spit on him for hours until there wasn't a single spot on his body not covered in blood. They wanted him alive. They shoved a crown of thorns down on his head so harshly it stuck in his skin. They wanted him alive. They shoved a cr sorry, after hours of being beaten, mocked, whipped, flogged and tortured, they made him walk with a cross. They made him carry it, a rough piece of wood with splinters digging into fresh wounds. They wanted him alive. They wanted him to feel every ounce of pain they could bring. He had to feel it in order to heal us. Crucifixion was historically one of the cruelest, most tortured deaths a human could face. Hours upon hours of torture. Torture most of us cannot mentally think of because the cruelty isn't normal. It isn't something our minds can comprehend. We celebrate Easter with pastel colors, happy children hunting eggs and chocolate. But the truth is, there was absolutely nothing happy about the day Jesus died. It was cruel, it was bloody and nasty. But he could have stopped it all. He could have called every angel in heaven to demolish every person standing and shouting, crucify him. He didn't. He knew in order to have a Sunday, you have to have a Friday. He knew in order to have joy, you have to carry your cross. And he felt everything that day. He felt how your heart broke wide open when you had to watch your baby die. He felt how heavy your life was when you were staring down the barrel of a gun, wondering if the man you called husband was going to shoot you. He carried the weight of the burden you have felt since your spouse died, and life just doesn't seem right since. On that cross, he held the rapist and the murderers, the sinner and the saint. He leveled every playing field, and he said, all of you are worth it. He knew he had to carry the cross. He never promised the cross you carry in this life would not be heavy. His wasn't. His promise is that Sunday is coming. No matter how heavy Friday is, financially, emotionally, mentally or physically, Friday is heavy. That cross weighing you down so that you're about to crumble under its weight. His promise was simply this. He won't make you carry it alone. What kind of king would step down from his throne for this. Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God did for you. He did every bit of it for you and for me. Oh yes, it is heavy. So heavy sometimes you do not think you can take one more step. But look up, because Sunday is coming. Father God, we cannot conceive of the pain you suffered for our sake. Thank you for the cross.
Let's stand together.
Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb. Thank you, band. Uh, Lord God, we just pray that this morning our minds will be focused on the words that you have for us this morning and also on your great sacrifice. The fact that only you were worthy. Only you, Lord Jesus, fulfilled those prophecies in Psalm 22 and, and in Isaiah and so many others. Only you, Lord Jesus, could have paid the price. Thank you, Lord. Let's turn in our Bibles, if you have them with you, to Matthew uh, chapter 26, verse 1. Um, as often happens, I, I, I spent a whole month going over in my head a sermon that I wanted to bring this morning, and when I finally came to preach that sermon, I read one verse and God changed everything. <laughs> and I started writing, and, and the whole other sermon just flowed, so um, I believe that that's God, and so this is what we have. Uh, Let's start by reading from verse 1, chapter 26. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, As you know, the Passover is, in t is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over and will be crucified. Let me just set the scene. Jesus had just spent quite a long time talking to um, Pharisees and, and disciples and all, kind, all manner of people in quite a lengthy session about all kinds of things. Uh, he's spoken about the end of the age. He's spoken about um, how blind the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were and what hypocrites they are. And it was quite a lengthy session, and there was an awful lot to take in. And just at the tail end of this, he says, Passover, I'm going to go get crucified now. I assumed, because I hadn't read this verse in quite a long time, probably about a year, I kind of was preempting the next verse, and I assumed it would be the bit where maybe the disciples are saying, no, don't go and do it, we'll hide you, we'll, we'll protect you. Don't go to the Passover, don't go to Jerusalem. Don't, well, you don't have... I was shocked when I read the next verse, and I thought, that was not what I expected. Let's read verse 2. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled... In the place in the palace of high priest, whose name was Tiaphas, and they plotted to arrest Jesus in some sly way and to kill him, but not during the feast, they said, or there may be riot among the people. And I thought, oh, they've moved on to a different subject. In fact, the disciples, according to this, didn't seem that bothered. They didn't say anything. So I thought, oh, maybe it's just this gospel. So I checked Mark, Luke, John. Nothing in there either. Well, hello. I thought, why? Why is it that it's not been recorded what they said? Could it be that Jesus told the disciples so many times why he had come that they'd already braced themselves for the inevitable? Maybe. Or could it be that they were always trying to figure out what the real meaning was? Jesus spoke in so many parables that maybe they thought that it was metaphorical. Maybe they thought Jesus was exaggerating. After all, he'd been going on about it for so long, they were probably a bit blasé about the whole subject. Or they were just tired. Well, no matter what the reason, his death did not seem to command the urgency that it deserved. Let's read on, verse 2 to verse 16. In fact, let's just read verse 16. Uh, let's start from verse 6, in fact. While Jesus was in Bethany, in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar, a very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. So this is just after. This is the very next bit that happens. 
When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing for me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. I tell you the truth, whenever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And then one of the twelve, the one they called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, what are you willing to give me if I hand over to you? If, if I hand him over to you. So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. From then on, Jesus, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Again, I would have expected the disciples to be asking all kinds of questions about his death. He's just said, I'm going to get buried. I've just been prepared for burial. Trying to talk him out of it, maybe, or, or talk some sense into him, or something, but no! The very next verse tells us about how one of them goes to negotiate payment for Jesus' betrayal. Anyone just coming to the story at this beginning of this chapter, 20, chapter 26 would think that the disciples didn't actually care that much about Jesus. They don't seem to be bothered about him, his impending death, and one of them is selling him out to the authorities. And so far, the only thing that has bothered them in this chapter is how much a jar of perfume cost. Then in verse 17, they ask, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? And uh, even now, they seem to be under the misconception that it's business as usual. And maybe uh, they understood fully the, the short time they had with Jesus. Um, but that's not how it reads. Let's read 17 to 25. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations to eat the Passover? He replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the, pas the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them to prepare the Passover. When the evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table um, with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to one another, surely not I, Lord. Jesus replied to one, replied, the one who dips his hand in the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. When they are eating the Passover, in 21, verse 21, Jesus says to them, One of you will betray me. And then it says, And they were sad. And I thought, at last, they get it. At last, they're sad about Jesus dying. They've suddenly woken up. He's going to die. Oh, no. And they were sad. But if you read on, it seems that they're only sad about who's to blame. Surely not me. Not me, is it? It's not me. It's not you. It's not you. Is it me? It's not me. Which one of us is it? Again. They don't seem that bothered about Jesus dying. It's odd if you read it through. It's quite odd. They were more concerned about the way they looked. Now let's skip forward to the Garden of Gethsemane because the next bit after that is where Jesus tells Peter, you're going to deny me three times and, and we all know how that went. Okay, so let's skip forward. Uh, to the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, now, this is the night when Jesus is arrested. 
And he takes Peter and James and John with him to pray. Let's pick up at verse 36 uh, to 46. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here a while while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him and began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you, as you will. Then he returned to the disciples and found them asleep. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Then he went a second time and prayed, My father, if it is possible for this cup to be taken away, un unless I drink it, may your will be done. Then he came back, and again he found them sleeping, because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed for a third time, saying the same thing. Then he returns to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near. The Son of Man is betrayed the hands of, into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. And so to recap, in verse 2, Jesus tells his disciples he would be crucified, and they didn't, and that didn't seem to elicit a response. Then in verse 12, he told them he was being prepared for burial, but they were worried about the cost of perfume. In verse 15, one of them sells Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. Verse 22, they seem more concerned with who's blamed for betraying him than the actual betrayal itself. In verse 35, Peter um, says he won't disown Jesus, but later he does it anyway. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter, James, and John can't even stay awake while Jesus is in so much distre distress that he sweats drops of blood. In this chapter, the disciples were such a letdown. Well, maybe, just maybe, I'm being a little bit harsh. We don't really know what they were thinking. I might be being a little unfair, and we don't know actually what was said that isn't recorded. Uh, but I do want to share what I feel God was telling me whilst I was writing this sermon. Just as time is short was short, when the disciples turned a blind eye to Jesus' imminent death, we as workers in the harvest field turn a blind eye to those who ne need to hear the good news about Jesus. I'm going to read that again. Just as time was short, when the disciples turned a blind eye to the Lord Jesus' Im imminent death, we as workers in the harvest field turn a blind eye to those who need to hear the good news about Jesus. We can go about our lives being good people and enjoying the many blessings that come with knowing the Lord of hosts, secure that we are adopted into the family, enjoying the knowledge that we have eternal inheritance and do nothing. We can be celebrating every day that we're a Christian, free from our shame, free from our sin, celebrating that we're going to be in eternity with heaven. And it's a wonderful thing, maybe freed from our sickness, freed from our illness. And we can hold the friend, the, our friend's hands and walk them straight into the gates of hell. Just as the disciples, just as Jesus told the disciples in verse 2, he was about to be crucified and they seemed to pay no attention the Word of God tells us that our friends and loved ones and the people in our parish 
that don't know Jesus are headed for death. Yet we're t- we too, too often we do nothing. We sweep it under the carpet. And we, we pretend it's not our problem. That it's someone else's job to share the good news. Maybe like in verse 12, when the disciples were concerned with the price of perfume, were too consumed with the things of this world to be effective in our work for the Lord. Too distracted to see the writing on the wall and maybe even enjoying the world too much to see the urgency of the situation. I know that I'm probably not talking to everyone this morning. I know that many of us probably are on fire for God and tell people about Jesus everywhere we go. And that's wonderful. And keep doing it, please. I'm talking to those of us who forget. People sometimes like myself. That get distracted by, I don't know, the internet, for example. Or a career. Always at work. Thinking about having to make money. I want to share a story that Devin said I could share. Devin's my son, if you don't know. Um, he suffers with um, obsessional compulsive disorder order of a certain type. Um, and he uh, got addicted to screen time on the computer. Screen time. So he thought that maybe it was the fact he was watching too many films and couldn't stop watching the videos on YouTube. And so he got his flatmate, who was a computer programmer, to stop his computer showing images. So he only had scripts that he could read. And my son then got addicted to reading synapses and scripts and stories on the internet because he just couldn't tear himself away. It's an OCD thing. And so he then realized in an epiphany from God that he didn't need the internet at all. If he needed, really, really needed to do anything, he could go down to the library. And so he unplugged his computer, and he got a pair of pliers, and he chopped the plug off. And from that moment, he was free. <laughs> Absolutely free. <laughs> because he, he wasn't conforming to the ways of this world. The things that the world will tell you are important, 99% of the ti- time, mean Nothing. Nothing. Just chopped it off. My gran is 95 years old, and she's still living and breathing and and vibrant and alive and wonderful, and she has never had the internet in her life. Never. (laughs) She manages to go out and buy food without the internet. She manages to have a social life without the internet. When companies say, you have to log on to this app to get this app to do something, Um, And they say, what's compulsory? You have to. We don't do it any other way. Really? Well, all I actually need to live, all you actually need to live is food, water, shelter, clothes. Actually, in reality, oh, and obviously the word of God. Actually, in reality, none of those things are dependent on on the internet to get. The internet is a luxury that the world wants wants us to think is a necessity. Amen? What about our careers? We have to work for a living. But if we let that career take over and as our main focus, we have entirely lost the whole point that we're on this planet for, which is to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We need to work so that we can earn money, so that we can work for God. That's it. That's it. And if your work is taking you away from your walk with God, or making you focus on things that aren't healthy, change your job. Simple. Simple. Change your job. Change your focus. Okay, so back to this. Maybe, like in verse 22, the disciples all said to him, um, surely not I, were more concerned with how they looked, more concerned with their image than facing reality. Like Peter um, Like Peter, you would rather deny Jesus than preach the truth because you feel uncomfortable. So this is a slightly different subject about when we are with our friends, but we're embarrassed about Jesus. The Bible says that if we deny him, 
in front of people, he'll deny us in front of the Father. Are we embarrassed when we're a people to say that we are Christians? I certainly hope not. Or have you lost your way? Are you sleeping like the disciples were in Gethsemane when you should be praying for those that who could be taken from us any minute? How many times have we lost a friend or a loved one suddenly that didn't know the Lord and we said, if only I'd known, I'd have told them about Jesus. I'd have given them a gospel tract. I'd have brought them to church. I'd maybe ask them if I could pray for them. Anything, really. I believe that I personally have a gifting for friendship evangelism. I'm pretty good at it, in all honesty. I I think I am. Forcing our beliefs on people isn't always the best way. In fact, it rarely is the best way to bring someone to Christ. Building up a relationship and a friendship and then telling someone about the good news of Jesus is the way I prefer to work. And I think most people should. There's a place for street preaching. Tomorrow, Devon is out on the streets preaching, and people do get saved like that, but it doesn't work for me, personally. But I want to tell you my secret. I have a secret to this, right? In order for friendship evangelism to work, you have to be 100% sold out for Jesus. And you have to let them know that you're 100% sold out out for Jesus from the off-go, from the get-go, from the beginning, when, I'm in the Knights of, when I was in the Knights of Antioch, I wore a big cross on my back. I'm in the CMA now, I wear a big cross on my back. They know that I'm a Jesus freak. They know that I love Jesus. I don't go in all, go in all guns blazing, Bible bashing straight away, telling them about Jesus day one, but they know. I might tell them I'm going to church. I might tell them I love Jesus, but that's, I leave it there for a while. Get to know people. Get to know people. Once they know that you're 100% sold out for Jesus and that you're going to accept them for who they are and what they are, they expect you to tell them about Jesus. In fact, in my experience, if I get to know people and don't start talking about Jesus after I've got to know them for a bit, but they know I'm 100% sold out for Jesus, they start to think I'm not 100% sold out for Jesus. They start to wonder why I'm not practicing what I preach. Not, that's the the wrong wording. Why why I'm not doing what I say, you know, um, fulfilling the label on the can. I'm supposed to be a Christian. I'm supposed to be telling people about Jesus. They expect it. If you don't do it, they wonder why. No one has ever turned their back on me, stopped talking to me, unfriended me, disowned me because I told them about Jesus. Not one. Because I told them about the wonderful things that God is doing in my life or the wonderful things that God is doing in someone else's life. Not one. And I promise you that if you're excited about God and don't judge people and accept them for who they are, that you'll make more progress that way. The even better news, actually I'm going to share a little story first. When I was at the biker breakfast, for those of you who don't know, it's a, it's a breakfast put on by, um, by Christian bikers, and about a couple of hundred now bikers turn up from all over the shop um, in different bike clubs and, uh, and enjoy a free brekkie and, and it's part of the community. And someone said to me, I was at this bike breakfast, um, there was another Christian, with a cross on their back, they said, I, I can't, I just can't share the gospel. I don't know how to do it. But I'd already built a relationship with a lot of these guys. And so I picked someone at random, and there's a lady called Jackie, and I just went over to Jackie, and I said, It's like this, you do it like this, come with me. <laughs> I sat down, I said, Jackie, how do you walk with Jesus? Out of the blue. And Jesus said, Well, I used to go to Sunday school. I used to be, I think she said she used to be a Mormon. And then she started telling me all about her relationship with God up to this point. She told me all about her friend, Mel Baldock, who used to come to this church, by the way, who phones her pretty much every day and tells her about Jesus. 
most people are more than willing to talk to you about it if you've already built up a friendship. And this guy that was with me was a little bit like, oh, okay, <laughs> so it's that simple. <laughs> you just got to have the guts to do it, you know? <laughs> Even better news is that we don't have to share the gospel on our own. John 14, 26 says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all, th- he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. I'll read that again. Take note this time. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things, and bring back to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Now that is a promise from God that's dependent on two things. Firstly, you have to invite the Holy Spirit in so that he can tell you what to say. And secondly, it says that he'll remind us of the things that Jesus said. If we haven't read our Bible and we don't know what Jesus said, he can't remind us of it. We have to know the word of God. Specifically, hear the words of Jesus. It is written in red for a reason, because it brings life. Like blood is red, it brings life. The words of Jesus bring life. We have to read the word of God. And then, when we're talking to people, God will bring it back to our remembrance. It will flow. The things that they need to hear, even though sometimes you might think, oh, that wasn't very good, I shouldn't have said that. How do we know that God knows what they need to hear? And whatever we say will not go to waste. We need to be prepared to speak about Jesus in season and out of season. Praying continuously that God will give us an opportunity to share his love. So my challenge is if it isn't obvious, is to be fearless in speaking about Jesus. The disciples didn't see the urgency, but I believe we must understand the urgency that we are stood in the harvest field and the harvest is rotting because the workers are too few. The disciples were distracted by money, but we need to lift up our eyes from material things and the distraction of this world and be able to discern what is important from what the world think what, what the world wants us to think is important. The disciples were sleeping when they should have been praying. But we're told to pray without ceasing. In two days, we'll be celebrating Jesus' resurrection that made it possible for man to be reconciled to the Father and forgiven. We are made new and adopted into God's family. And one day, we will share an inheritance and have eternal life with heaven, with God in heaven. We will be full of joy. But we must remember that God didn't just come to save me and you and the person next to you in this congregation. God came to save the person that's outside of these walls that we haven't spoken to yet. Wouldn't it be tragic if on that day in heaven there are people not with us that should have been And the reason they aren't with us in heaven is because we didn't get our act together. We didn't know the words of Jesus and couldn't share what the Holy Spirit wanted us to share. Or we were too focused on a career or watching videos on the internet to talk to someone about the love of God. Or we were just too fearful in sharing God's love. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your sacrifice. For the pain that you went through being wrenched away from the Father so that we could be reconciled to him. Lord, we thank you that when you died and you raised up your voice and shouted, this is finished, that the curtain that separated man from God was literally torn in two. Lord, we thank you that you have called us all for a purpose. 
We have different giftings. We have different abilities. But we have one mission. We have one job. And I pray in Jesus' name that you would empower us with your Holy Spirit and with boldness. And make us ready to speak your words so that that sacrifice would not be in vain. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friday is about setting our hearts towards the climax of humanity, of human history. Everything pivots on Good Friday. The death of Jesus is what took away the wrath of God that each one of us deserved to bear. The cross, the sacrifice that Jesus went through to pay for our sins. The cross represents the washing away of all our wrongdoing, all our mistakes, past, present, future. And when we take communion, we proclaim the Lord's death. We show it, we symbolize it, we represent it. When Jesus died, it was good news. It was good news then, and it's good news today. It's good news for us because it means that Jesus took your rebellion and he dealt with it on the cross. And it was all put to death. And so when we come to this table, we are remembering the death of Christ and its importance in our lives. Just as these elements of bread and juice are physical things, we can hold them, we can sense them, we can taste them. So is the grace of God given to us through Jesus. This is his body that was broken for us. This is his blood that was shed to take away our sins. And this spiritual reality of these things is present and it conveys to us his grace every single time we come to this table. This is the nourishment that we all need. This is the spiritual fruit that we all crave for. Jesus wants you to see that he really is for you. He really is for you. He really does love you. He really did die for you. And these elements show that we have a continued fellowship and a continued union with Jesus. Today, this table confirms my union with Christ. It confirms the unbreakable bond that Christ has made with me, with you, with us. It's unbreakable. It's an inseparable bond given to us through his sacrifice. We don't get life without death. We don't get Sunday without Friday. And if you are a believer, or even if you're not, you are and you could be united to Christ forever through recognizing the good in Good Friday. And you get to be in communion and fellowship with him forever if you recognize the good in Good Friday. And this meal confirms that our communion and our ongoing fellowship with Jesus 
And so when you eat and drink these elements, you're affirming your faith in Christ, whether you've done it a million times or today would be your first. This table is not about your good works. It's not about the list that you've kept this week of all those times that you've been pleasant and been a good boy and said your manners. It's not about your works. But it's about Jesus' good works. That's why Friday is good. Because of his good works. It's about his death for you. That's why we're here. That's why I'm stood here. That's why we're gathered. He was forsaken so that we will never be forsaken. He was forsaken so that we will never be forsaken. No matter what you're sat on this morning, he will never forsake you. He will never abandon you. He will never leave you. And so we break this bread together. Reminding us of his broken body that took all that punishment. 39 lashes. He was spat. He was mocked. He was punished. Broken body. Absolutely in bits. And left to die. He bore our sin and shame, carrying the weight of this fallen world. And we take this cup as a symbol of his pierced body, his shed blood, the atoning sacrifice, the atonement, the atoning sacrifice means that we've been made at one with Christ because of this, his blood that was poured out for the forgiveness of sins. For each one of us. And through Good Friday, we've been set free. Through Good Friday, you've been redeemed. You're being restored. You're being forgiven. And you have union with the maker with the creator of heaven and earth. We don't get Sunday without Friday. We're not going to jump ahead today, but we're going to sit in these moments. And I invite you to come take bread, come take a cup, sit in your seat, sit and dwell on Friday and what that means for you what that means that he took for you you know you and he knows you too spend a moment thanking him maybe asking him for the first time spend a moment before you do anything else today Thank him, him, for giving his life upon the cross for you. Not just today, not just this morning, but for ever, for eternity. Because once you take this by faith and acknowledge what he's done, you are in his family. You are in the kingdom of God. You have been paid for table is open today for each one of us to come. And so maybe form a queue on my left and form a queue on my right. Take your time. Take your time. Do not rush ahead with anything else. Father, we thank you for your provision in Jesus. 
We thank you that we can come to the table this morning and appreciate, Lord, your broken body, your shed blood. Holy Spirit, help us to receive this truth today. Help it take root. Lord, help it compel our hearts, Lord, to be glad to respond, to know the depths of your love at work in our lives. And so that, Lord, today would be Good Friday for us. Amen. Just come when you feel free.
just whilst uh, taking communion and um, just asking God for direction, um, just had a couple of words, and it was, it's time to let go. Don't know what it's for, don't know who it's for. Could be for all of us, could be for one of us, it could be for several of us. But that's the word, and I'm sure that everything is going to come to light for that those people, that person, but it is time to let go. Jesus' last words. It is finished. It is finished. It's done. It's on the cross. Your guilt, your shame, it's on the cross. Don't pick it up. Don't take it away from God's provision. But let go. Leave it with him. And walk away from here. Ready for Sunday. Ready to embrace new life ready to embrace salvation, redemption, forgiveness, mercy, grace. Ready to embrace all that he has for you. Don't pick it up. Let go. Father, we thank you today. Thank you, Lord, that we can trust you. That, Lord, we can bring our brokenness. We can bring our secrets. We can bring our mistakes. We can bring our sin to you. And know, and know that you love us. And know that you forgive us. And know that you will never turn your back and know that your arms are open wide and know that we can leave it with you today. Holy Spirit, seal our hearts before we leave this place today, branded by your love, with hearts sealed by your Spirit. Amen. Try not to get excited. The team are going to lead us with our final song. together guys
Praise us to him now.